Hello, welcome to the 10th video of module 2, which is about misleading graphs. In this video, we'll discuss how graphs can be used to make you think a certain thing or a certain way. So when you see a graph on TV or in Facebook or magazine or something, you can think a little bit more critically about what is the creator of the graph actually trying to get you to think. There are many different ways that graphs can be used to mislead you and they could be used in combination together. So we're just going to talk about six different techniques and we're going to kind of look at them one at a time to help identify these particular features. But most often these techniques are used in combination with each other. The first misleading method that we're going to talk about happens when you abuse a principle called the area principle. So the area principle states that the area of the representation should be proportional to the value it represents. In other words, if item B happens twice as often as item A, you want the representation for item B to be twice as large as the representation for item A. So for example, suppose I wanted to make two boxes where one of the boxes was twice as large as the other one. I might begin by drawing this. So the box on the left it has a height of 1 and a width of 1, and the box on the right has a height of 2 and a width of 2. This kind of makes sense because you want the green box to be twice as large as the blue box, so you'll make the sides twice as large. Now let's think about what it means for something to be twice as large. If one thing is twice as large as another, it should be that the larger one could contain exactly two of the smaller one. However, if I look at how many blue boxes fit in this green box, I don't fit just two, I fit four. So the bigger box was not twice as large as the smaller one, it was actually four times as large. So when I double both the width and the height of the representation, I much more than double the area. So the way that we can get around this, the way that we can use the area principle appropriately, is to only increase one dimension. So here I've kept the width of the boxes the same, but I've increased the height, I've doubled the height to be two. And now we can see that the twice as large rectangle actually does contain two of the blue boxes. So this representation is proportional to the amount we want it to represent. Folks that abuse the area principle generally do so to exaggerate differences. So let's see this uh, happening in a graph. The graph below presents the results of a 2015 poll of Americans which asked which statement comes closest to your views about the treatment of animals. In this graph, there were three options and you can see the one that's presented in the middle had definitely the largest amount with 62% and the one on the right had the teeniest tiniest amount, the 3%. Look at how much smaller the bar for 3% is than the bar for the 62%. 62% is definitely much larger. And the 32%, which was the middle amount, the bar on the left, is substantially smaller than the 62%, actually. If you think about it, 32% should be half as large as 62%, about. And it looks much smaller to me than half. So let's look at these bars redrawn so that the width is the same and the heights are the only things that change. So you can see that the 62% bar now looks a little bit smaller than it did before, um, and the 32% bar looks a little bit larger. The 3% bar looks much larger than it did before, and this is now an appropriate way of presenting the data. Now, the 62% bar is still the largest because it's still the largest percentage. However, it is not disproportionately large. So again, let's compare these two graphs side by side so we can see what an impact this has. In the graph on the left, that 62% definitely looks way larger than the 3% and much larger than it should. In the graph on the right, while the 3% is definitely the smallest bar, you can like actually see it. A second way that graphs can be used to mislead is when the horizontal axis is labeled with an inconsistent scale. And what this does is it sort of puts a pattern to the data that may or may not naturally be there. So you can't really trust the trend that is being shown. So let's look at an example of this with some uh, MVCC data. 
The time series below illustrates the number of criminal justice AAS graduates from MVCC from 2008 to 2014. And I pulled this from data on the MVCC website and you can check it out if you want. On the website, you can find data like this for all different programs. So if you're interested in your own program, you can check it out. If we look at this graph, right on the bottom, we have the months and the years, and it goes from 2008 to 2014, and we can see that this graph is steadily rising, which means we have more and more criminal justice graduates. So that's the trend that we're trying to show in this graph. However, I created this graph, and when I created it, I wanted this particular trend to be seen. And I was a little sneaky, because if I look at the first two data points, it's graduates in August of 2008 and August of 2009. The next two data points came from December, and the last two data points came from May. And I did this because we have three points of time which you can graduate at MV. You can graduate after a summer course in August, you can graduate in December, or you could graduate in May. Most students tend to graduate in May, and then the fewest students, least number of students, graduate in August. So I specifically picked the time when fewer students would graduate to be the beginning and when most students would graduate to be the end. And another thing that I did here, if we look at the May years, I skipped 2013. There is a reason I skipped 2013. Let's investigate why. So this graph illustrates only those who graduated in May of each year. And you'll notice in May of 2013, we actually had fewer graduates than May of 2012. And that's why I skipped that year when I made my graph before. So this graph displays the number of criminal justice graduates a little bit more appropriately. We could also include this graph with those who graduated in August. Notice that the number of graduates in August is substantially lower than the number of graduates in May. I kept the same scale, so we could do this comparison. And also December. And the number of December graduates varies wildly. Um, definitely an increase, sort of from 2008 to 2012, but that weird sort of spike in 2010. That data looks very different from the other two. Or I could look at all graduates combined, and that's what this would look like. That's probably what we ought to do, is the criminal justice graduates every year. So this would include May, August, and December. So if I look at these four graphs, yes, the number of graduates is uh, increasing, but the total number of graduates is less in 2014 than it was in 2012, which is definitely not what we would have thought if we were looking at the original graph that we presented. The third way to mislead is basically when you're trying to make a graph more interesting, but the techniques you use get in the way. So while images can certainly attract interest in a chart, interfering graphics can also obfuscate or confuse the data. They can kind of hide what the data are saying. So let's look at a pictograph that I made uh, specifically uh, with this in mind. Dataset 37 at the Quantitative Learning Project gives the probability of dying by various methods. This data was used to construct this graph below. So we have the number of deaths per 1,000 people, and each picture represents a different thing. So the cigarettes represent death due to cigarettes, the guy in the green surgeon's outfit represents deaths due to cancer, the purple cars represent deaths due to motor vehicle accidents, the house that's on fire are deaths due to home accidents, and the old-timey picture of a gentleman drinking represents death due to alcohol. So if I just look at the top part of the graph, it looks like the most likely way that you're going to die is by cancer, um, since we have about five and a half surgeons. And the second most likely way to die is by cigarettes, since there are five cigarettes. If I look at the two least likely ways to die, it looks like you are twice as likely to die in a home accident as you are due to alcohol. However, when I looked at my key and told you what each of the pictures represented, I was not being very precise. I just looked at for what does the image represent in terms of way of dying. I didn't carefully read that the pictures also represent an amount due to dying, and these amounts are not the same. For example, every cigarette doesn't represent one death due to cigarettes, it represents 50. So since each cigarette represents 50 deaths and there are five cigarettes, 50 times five is 250 people per 1,000. 
If we do the math for the surgeons, 40 times about five and a half will give us 220 per 1,000. So the pictures made us think that the most likely way to die was through cancer, but actually it's through cigarettes. We can keep going if I look at the vehicles. These only represent five deaths due to motor vehicle accidents. So five times four is 20. This is much smaller than cancer or cigarettes, but the way that the graph has been constructed makes us think that they're almost equal. And then if we look at the homes, these also represent five deaths per image. So we have only 10 per 1,000. And the gentleman drinking alcohol only represents one death. So since there's only one of him, there's only one per 1,000. So what we thought before was that the alcohol would be half as much as the homes, but it's actually a tenth as large. So if we wanted to display this information appropriately while still using these pictures, we would need to first make sure that each picture represented the same number of deaths. And the other thing we're going to need to do is to make sure that the pictures are all approximately the same size. For example, here the purple cars are much wider than, say, the cigarettes or the surgeons, which gives them more of a presence than they should have on the screen. Remember, the area principle is also at play here. So let's see what this looks like appropriately created. Here we go, a very different sort of graph. In this case, all of the images are approximately the same width and height, and every image represents five deaths. So we can see that there are many more deaths due to cancer than to motor vehicle accidents, whereas before they looked almost the same. Also, we don't even get a full picture for deaths due to alcohol. We only get just a fifth of the image since there was only one per 1,000. The fourth misleading method is sort of a caution to beware of misused percentages. The usual place you'll see this is when percents in a pie chart don't add up to 100%. So let's see why that might happen. The graph below illustrates the percentage of first-time, full-time matriculated students at MVCC who receive each of the different types of financial aid. So here we see that 35% of our students receive federal financial aid, 68% receive Pell, and 69% receive TAP. So if I look just at the Pell recipients, that's 68%. 68% is more than half. So that means that piece of the pie should be more than half of the pie. Same thing with TAP, right? 69% is more than half. So the TAP percentage should also be more than half. So you can't have two pieces of a pie being more than half the size of the pie, because then you would have more than one pie. So why is this happening? This is most likely happening because students receive more than one type of aid, right? You might receive both TAP and Pell, or you might receive all three, right? Federal aid, TAP, and Pell. So a better way to display this information instead of in a pie chart is in a bar graph. Here we can see that most students receive both TAP and Pell, and in a bar graph the percents don't have to add up to be 100% like they do in a pie graph because we're not looking at a percentage out of a pie, we're looking out of percentages out of the student population. So if you have categories that overlap, then a bar graph may be more appropriate than a pie chart. The next method that could be used is when the vertical axis has a non-zero baseline. In other words, your vertical axis doesn't start at zero. And when you do this, the effect is similar to misusing the area principle. You're going to exaggerate the differences. So you can make things look like they are growing much more quickly or shrinking much more quickly or slowly than uh, is actually the case. So here's an example of that. The bar graph below illustrates the number of people displaced from their homeland due to war from 2005 to 2014. Now, I got access to this information when I was perusing the website for the Refugee Center in Utica, New York. So this graph is showing over a 10-year span that the number of people who've had to leave their home because of war has been increasing dramatically over this 10-year span. If I look at 2014, it's pretty close to 60 million people. And if I just ignore the axis and I look at 2005, it looks like almost nobody. However, the vertical axis doesn't start at zero, so that 2005 isn't almost nobody. The vertical axis actually starts at 36, so that 2005 is actually probably 37, 38 million people. 
which is very different from almost nobody. So let's look at this graph with an appropriate vertical axis. So here the vertical axis is starting at zero. So we can see in 2005, there was definitely a substantial number of people who were displaced during this time period. Additionally, we can see that although the bars are increasing, they're not increasing as steeply as the graph we saw before. So let's compare the two side by side. So in the graph on the left, we definitely see that the increase from say about 2011 to 2014 was much more dramatic than in the graph on the right. Now this doesn't mean that the graph on the right doesn't show an increase because it definitely does. When you truncate the axis, you exaggerate changes and you can see finer details. So if you wanted folks to be able to see the detail more clearly, you would probably display both of these graphs with the graph on the right being the main graph of your presentation and then you would explain let's zoom in on a portion so we can kind of see the finer details of what's going on so you get both the big picture and the finer details and the last method we're going to discuss about how graphs can be misleading is by using a three-dimensional display and although this can engage like with our pictograph it relies on distorting perception in order to achieve its effect which since you're distorting part of the graph, you're distorting some of your understanding, your representation of the data. So let's look at an example of this. Gallup conducted a poll of Americans and interviewed them regarding their pet ownership. So this graph is a pie chart displaying what percentage of Americans own different types of pets. Now one thing that's important here is they wanted to avoid misusing percentages. So look at the three categories in the front. We have cat and dog, cat, no dog, and dog no cat. The reason they have these three different pieces of the pie is to avoid that overlapping issue that we saw before. Also notice that these three pieces of our pie appear to be about the same. So about the same percentage have both a cat and a dog as those who only have a cat or those who only have a dog. Now these three pieces are clearly the focal point of this graph. The Americans who own no pets is diminished because it's in the background, and those who have other pets that aren't a cat or a dog is a very small piece of the pie on the left. But look what happens when we flatten this graph out. Now, the no pets portion of the pie that was greatly diminished in the previous graph is almost half of the graph, it's 41%. So we see that a substantial number of Americans do not own a pet at all. Also, remember that the blue, yellow, and red were about the same size, the cat and dog, cat no dog, and dog no cat. But when we look at the graph flattened out, the dog no cat is more than twice as large as the cat no dog. So let's compare these two charts side by side. And we can definitely see that these two graphs, which are displaying the same data, make the data look extremely different. The 41% in the graph on the left is very diminished, whereas it's a substantial portion of the graph on the right. And those three other pieces about cats and dogs appear to be about the same on the left, and they are very different on the right. So if you're creating a pie chart with a three-dimensional display, you want to be careful and make sure that it displays your data appropriately, which is very challenging to do using that technique. Similarly, when you are looking at a three-dimensional pie chart, be very careful and see what do they have in front because whatever they're putting in the front of the pie chart is what they are trying to exaggerate. It's what they're trying to get you to focus on. And anything in the back, they're trying to diminish as less important. All right, this concludes our last video of module two. In module three, we'll now discuss how do you summarize information. So for example, how can you describe like an average temperature someplace? Or how do you measure like how spread out a data set is? So if the data ranges from five to 10, that's very different from if the data ranges from five to a thousand, right? So how can we describe that in a succinct way without showing all of the data? So if you would like to start module three, you can click on the arrow on the right. If you wanna go back and review pie charts and time series, you can click on the arrow on the left. Thanks for watching our videos and have a fantastic day.